Namaskar and good afternoon to you from Goa. This is Dr. Manoj Borkar. I work as an associate professor of zoology and heads of the Department of Zoology at uh, Carmel College for Women in Goa, Goa's premier institute for high learning for women. And this afternoon, but me, I shall be speaking to you on uh, technology-driven wildlife research and career opportunities. Um, so to start with, as you can see on my screen, there are quite a few visually impressive images. On the left, you've got a gadget, which is a remote-controlled um, camera mounted on a vehicle. Uh, uh, in the center, you've got a bat, a flying fox of the genus Teropus. And on the right, you've got the um, a frog with inflated vocal sacs. So <clears throat> to start with, I think I would like to draw your attention to the concept of wildlife per se. Um, invariably, when we speak about wildlife, the images that flesh before our eyes are something very charismatic, very majestic, something with a lot of stripes and colors and something uh, which can uh, vocalize in terms of trumpeting or or maybe pudding or uh, hissing or something like that. Uh, not forget, or invariably, we believe that wildlife is something which is pretty uh, big in size, and we fail to understand that uh, wildlife also includes a lot of tiny and uh, the lesser known fauna, which uh, shares the space wilderness with the more charismatic forms. So, the, the starting point of my discourse is to uh, uh, make uh, the main wildlife as is defined by Webster's dictionary. Wildlife is absolutely all you know living species, with the exception of our own kind, that is human beings exempted, and of course uh, the domesticated variety. So absolutely every single species that resides within wilderness, barring the human species and the domesticated ones, qualified to be known as a wildlife. And uh, I don't think I need to, uh, uh, you know, overemphasize the importance of wildlife in a country like ours. India is a mega diverse country. I mean, it 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 hosts and supports uh, a bewildering diversity of uh, life in, in all its splendid uh, sizes and shapes and variety and variability. And of course, not forget numbers. Um, it, it is also our responsibility to protect to preserve and conserve this living heritage and treasure for posterity, not just why we enjoy this wildlife for our own sake. Uh, wildlife, of course, has got multitudes of values ranging from uh, ethical values, aesthetic values, ecological values, economic values, scientific values, and not forget again uh, that we are Indians. Uh, the bedrock of our culture is uh, respect to all forms of life for spiritual values, where you integrate a lot of these wild species uh, and and probably you know uh, pass on some kind of divinity to many of these forms. So you you kind of sanctify these species, you you deify them. Uh, so you know with these multitudes of values that wildlife holds is not the only reason that we should be you know contributing towards the conservation and protection of wildlife. But I think they all have a right to live, just as you and I and all of us uh, have a share in the resources of this planet. So what I'm planning to do today is uh, take you through a quick run on uh, how this wildlife research, I mean, most certainly it is wildlife biology is a science. Uh, a lot of people have this kind of confusions between conservation biology, wildlife biology. There are very uh, you know subtle overlaps, but each domain of knowledge is very unique. It's it's discrete, and what I am uh, intending to do today, or the next ninety minutes that I desire to speak to you, is take you through how this conventional, orthodox, traditional approach of studying wildlife has evolved over the years into something which is pretty modern and uh, technology driven. So that's the crux of the whole discussion. Uh, the topic for the day is technology driven wildlife research. And of course, uh, I think we should end that by uh, taking a quick look at the various career opportunities that this particular domain of knowledge presents. So here I go, we speak about technology driven wildlife research. Right. 
Um, so, I mean, you, you know, very conventionally, uh, a lot of people who go to the field in pursuit of wildlife would be equipped with uh, state-of-the-art cameras. And all of uh, us would agree that documenting wildlife in wilderness is uh, definitely one definite way of, uh, uh, you know, producing or putting forth an evidence of its presence in the field. So uh, there can't be a substitute for a good photograph, as always. They say a good photograph can probably equal maybe some tens, hundreds of books, uh, you know, crammed with words because a, a photograph can speak volumes if one knows how to interpret that. So in, in any attempt at understanding wildlife and communicating wildlife uh, and all the allied concepts to your audience, a good photograph can uh, do a, a lot good. So good quality photographs are very important uh, tool of communicating uh, knowledge pertaining to wildlife. Um, a, a good photograph can further the cause of wildlife protection. Uh, to the scientists, it helps in documenting the habitat, the dynamics of habitat change, uh, you, you know, the diversity of species, the wildlife endowments of a given geographic region. And to the layman, of course, there's no better way than to, you know, show them a few good photographs on wildlife, which could impress them and, and uh, arouse their curiosity in wanting to know more than what they already know. So I, I think that's one important uh, a, a point. Uh, and uh, a, a, a biologist not just going to the field and uh, kind of taking photographs himself, but he, he would have to uh, a, a probably employ uh, gadgets in the field in the field. And one important uh, aid in uh, wildlife research today are camera traps. You can uh, fasten or mount on very strategic field. The animal could be moving in the uh, the capture range. And this camera trap technology uh, today is uh, definitely doing a lot of addition to the kind of data that we are generating. So yes, I mean, uh, the advantage is that you don't need to be in the field. You you stay safe. You do not intrude on the privacy of the animal that you seek to uh, understand and study. So in a sense, it's non-invasive data collection, uh, which can uh, uh, you know open new vistas into our understanding of behavior, the population dynamics, the ecology, and and all in all, of course, about the conservation of that given species. So it's it's again a very widely employed tool in wildlife research. There are different kinds of camera traps available from a base price of about say 5,000 and odd to something uh, you know, in the higher bracket of price range. Um, if you know how to use that correctly, if you know how to uh, you know, strap your uh, camera trap to the right place, the right angle, the right height, vis-a-vis -vis the kind of animal that you seek to trap, I think it can yield a lot of good uh, uh, you, you know, information. Um, what exactly is the use of a camera trap in wildlife research? To start with, you want to know how many, not just how many kinds, but how many individuals of a given kind, which in simple words is if you want to estimate animal abundance, the numbers. You want to know how they move, the trajectory of the movement. Sometimes, you know, you do have animals that spill over from wilderness into human settlements and human habitation. And that's what triggers a lot of human wildlife conflicts. Uh, for example, on your screen, you can see a, a camera trap unit strapped to the uh, the bark of a tree at a strategic position so that it can capture an image. Uh, immediately on the right side of that image, you have a hyena, which is probably just lifted a, a, a kid, a goat kid, which is an episode of conflict because any loss of life of property, particularly to the pastoral community, could would evoke a lot of hostility towards wildlife. Um, as I said, and let me repeat, you want to know what kind of animals exist and uh, occupy a certain habitat in terms of diversity, indices, species richness. I think uh, camera traps can yield valuable information, not requiring of the researcher to be present in the field all the time. And uh, last of all, or at least of all, should I say, uh, today animal ethology is... Um, uh, picking fast. I mean, it's it's one, one uh, domain where uh, very little information is available and not too many takers because you have to spend a lot of time in the field. 
it demands of the ethologist to be uh, staying put in the field for a long hours of observation. Now, the, the, the presence of camera traps, the availability of camera traps is made, make it easier because you can just in a trap and just forget about that. Probably back um, after, say, 24 hours or a couple of days and retrieve all the footage. And, and that, that exactly uh, the, the nuances of the animal and the animal is also not disturbed by your presence. I mean, there's a thumb rule that um, uh, you're not on, on danger of um, a, a conflict, uh, uh, you, you know, episode. For instance, an animal, as I've just mentioned, which is just straight out of its wilderness, has probably entered into a human area and has started attacking people or lifting cattle, or, or the very, the, you know, the thought that you have the presence of. Uh, a, a predator on the prowl can create a sort of fear psychosis among the uh, you know the human settlers. So I think for all this kind of uh, uh, mitigatory intervention that you want to avoid a situation escalating into a full-fledged conflict because of a wild animal that is strayed out of its uh, territory and is now entering into a, a kind of very negative interaction with the people around. Um, you advance into the of this because the movement of the animal will uh, trigger the shutter, uh, you, you know, maybe uh, set on the flesh. Uh, sometimes you need to house that camera unit to avoid damage being caused by hostile environment, like maybe, uh, you, you know, you've got rains and uh, ins very strong insulation and so on and so forth. Uh, we've just been uh, recovering from a major pandemic of COVID-19 caused by that tiny little virus called SARS-CoV-19. You know, I, I think uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think especially during this COVID times when there were a lot of restrictions on movement, there were a lot of confinements to our homes and uh, a, a lot of you know curtailed uh, movement in public space because of quarantines, uh, camera traps have certainly been extremely useful. And uh, taking the discussion further, you, you've got uh, hidden and robotic cameras, which are camouflaged, mounted on some sort of uh, motorized uh, equipment so that you can stand in the place and keep on moving that equipment the way you want it. Uh, you, you've got these guys uh, on your screen, a couple of them. Uh, one, of course, of Indian origin at Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Jairam, who's uh, an expert in micro-robotics, uh, who's, uh, you know, uh, invented or maybe fa fabricated uh, or designed a micro-robo uh, based on the anatomy and morphology of a common household pest, which you can identify yourself, the American roach or the cockroach. We're very familiar with this right from our school days. Uh, as students of biology, you talk about Periplaneta Americana. And you'll be astonished to know that the template, the prototype uh, design called the Hammer Junior, uh, which is what you see on your screen, I, I, I presume you are able to see the image on the right side of the actual cockroach, is a, is a micro robot, which um, does something uh, extraordinary and incredible that it can creep and crawl into a very tiny space, or maybe it, it can go into subtle in burrows or uh, some sort of tunnels which are not very easy for you to access either because they are too narrow or maybe you know uh, it's too risky to kind of get into this kind of spaces which are dark and uh, you don't know what what is in store for what's waiting for you probably there could be a predator uh, hiding in the same crevice or same cave so you know i mean you you have something as small as a cockroach uh, i've given you the dimensions in particular that's just about 22.5 millimeters, that's barely around 0.9 inches. Uh, its total mass is about 320 milligrams, which is just 0.01 ounce, which is really very light. Uh, relative to its body, it's about 13.9 body lengths per second, which is about a foot per second, which is brilliant. That's the speed of movement. What can it do? What kind of movement do you expect with this gadget? It's, it's a micro robo. It can trot, it can trunk, it can bound, and it can jump. I mean, these are various kinds of uh, gates and movements that this micro robot can perform. Only, I mean, we've all been hearing about Chandrayaan uh, and uh, the the rover uh, and the and the lander and the rover that just walk up Pragyan. 
is supposed to be so uh, easily maneuvered by the command center in ISRO that it can avoid a crater, it can do a lot of maneuvering. This is exactly on the same lines. That if you want to send a micro robo with probably a camera mounted on its back, and that's amazing, it can carry a payload 10 times its own weight, which means you, you calculate about 320 milligrams into 10 is a kind of load that this small micro robo called Hammer Junior can carry. I think that's a beautiful hand-holding example of a hand-holding between technology and classical wildlife biology. Uh, I believe, uh, I still recall uh, during my student days, that's about three, three and a half decades ago, uh, the classic classical approach in wildlife biology, and I still recall the words of our professor telling us that to be a good wildlife biologist, and of course that, that still holds good, not that I deny the importance of being very observant, a keen eye for observation, first attribute of a student of biology and maybe wildlife biology in particular. Uh, patience and perseverance. I mean, you, you need loads of patience and you need indefatigable perseverance. You can't be uh, going to the field, not finding much that enthuses you, come back very desolate and you, you find him in kind of very disillusion and demoralized. There's nothing there to see. You need to persevere. Probably on a success, successive occasions, or succeeding occasions, you may uh, actually uh, stumble upon and come to what actually you seek to see. So I think keen eye for observation, patient and perseverance, and that's not enough. You know, it's, it's the most important quality of any researcher, not necessarily limited and confined only to wildlife biology, is a sharp interpretative mind. That's why it's not enough that you just see, you need to observe. It's not enough that you just hear, you need to listen when you go to the wilderness. And it's not just enough that you get enthralled with what you see, but you need to also put it down in your diary or in your notings, field diary, that is. Because, because human memory is short-lived and you, it'll be invariably biased in, in favor of something which is extraordinary and you tend to forget the mundane things. You know, and at a later stage, it becomes extremely difficult for you to retrieve all those observations. So I believe that's very essential to make notings and then be able to make sense out of that. So you collect the data in the field, you collate the data in, at, at your station or in your app, and then you try to analyze to make some meaningful interpret, interpretation of statistical confidence. I, I, I think that's the crux of the whole discussion. So yes, technology certainly um, improves and does a lot of value addition to uh, the kind of data that we used to collect once upon a time, just based on what we, on our senses, what we see, what we hear, and what we understand. So I, I think this is fabulous. This is again a thermal imagery that you see beneath uh, or to the left of left lower corner of your screen. Um, the the you know the heat radiated by the body can also be a, a clue to image animals in the dark. You don't get a clear resolved image, but you know more or less in which direction the herd of deers is moving because they're all radiating heat. And you've got thermal sensors that you trap in your camera, of course, you get a clear picture about how many animals do you have in which direction they go. And based on the seal out, that's the outline, you also know what animal are you talking about or what animal are you seeing. Apologies. So, of course, today you need to integrate many other domains in your um, understanding of wildlife biology. And one important attribute of any wilderness is the use of space by animals. Uh, normally, you speak of our habitat, which is not to be understood only uh, as a physical space per se, but um, a habitat, as I define, is um, uh, you know much more than a physical space wherein the animal finds shelter, a cover, uh, probably a right combination of climate, substrate, vegetation. Uh, no difficulty in finding mates. It's able to you know sort of pass on its genetic material and ensure that it's able to leave descendants. And of course, um, that's what constitutes a habitat. And uh, there are species specific nuances in the way animals use the habitat. Uh, you, you know, the way they space out, the way they congregate, the way they cooperate, the way they disoperate, uh, the way they change their habitat from one place to the other, the, the shift between the natal sites, the feeding sites, the stopover sites. So it's it's a very complex dynamics 
that the species, especially the motile ones, uh, demonstrate with respect to the use of the habit. Now, the sessile ones, by which I mean the species which do not really move much, uh, but are fixed in a given place, uh, they also have strategies in terms of minimizing uh, intraspecific competition. So I think if all this information could be uh, sort of digitized based on geo-coordinates, uh, you have a system called the Geographic Information System or GIS, which again has got multiple utility and applications today. Uh, it's a system which can capture, which can store, which can manipulate in the sense of, you know, you, you kind of, uh, you can play with that data. You can analyze to come to certain uh, important conclusions about the way animals relate to the space. Or oh, I'm when I keep on saying animals because I'm a zoologist, but it also applies to plants and trees, and they have a particular way in which they are distributed in the in space. You know, for example, the distribution can be random, the distribution could be patchy, the distribution could be in, in absolutely in any map uh, scattered. You see, so I mean, ultimately, the whole objective is not to crowd in a given place. Uh, so that you uh, very specifically avoid competing with one another, particularly for resources which are in short supply. So I guess that's very important again. So this system, which allows you to integrate biological information with a geographic information, is what is known as a GIS, or Geographic Information System. You've got a lot of these GIS tools which are being regularly and, uh, you know, commonly used in wildlife biology, particularly for uh, wildlife management, for understanding conservation future, for resolving human wildlife conflicts and so on and so forth. So what kind of data generally does uh, a, a GIS uh, software generate? I mean, it can tell you something about the spatial location pertaining to space, the quantities which are using a particular uh, a special, uh, you know, unit. It talks about densities, which is relating numbers to space or number to volume. Probably within a larger area, you have something very specific that you are interested in. I mean, I think you can get into that. Uh, also, the proximal features and you, very importantly, you can monitor change. I, I think that's the beauty of the whole thing. That in this approach of GIS in wildlife biology, uh, one is able to monitor change over a period of time. So you can retrospect uh, and based on this kind of modeling, you can also prospect. So you, I have a few things that we have put, put up here. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at some of these images, they're all pertaining to the use of habitats by animals. And in GIS, you've got multiple layers. You see, you do layering and you can separate out layers and you can integrate layers to look at one single comprehensive picture. For instance, when you look around yourself at any landscape, there are multitudes of components in that landscape. For example, you have the vegetation, you have a linear infrastructure, which is uh, the engineered asset. For example, you would have roads, would have bridges, you would have installation of mobile towers, right? Or, or maybe you, you've got a lot of human activity, you, you know, happening in that. For instance, you've got people moving, you've got animals moving, you've got um, movement and so on and so forth. Or you're only looking at wildlife per se amidst all this, uh, you, you know, a mix of attributes. Uh, GIS permits you to single out these layers. Uh, you can see on your screen, one uh, comprehensive image which integrates everything, which is what you see on top probably, uh, which has got to do with your the presence of tiger in a territory, how the linear infrastructure within the tiger territory uh, probably impedes the movement, causes disruption of the tiger corridor connectivity, which is a major issue today because of uh, the pace of uh, urbanization and linear infrastructure, uh, the, the, the kind of... Um, you know, very aggressive pace at which we are investing in linear infrastructure, be that bridges, be that roads, uh, you know, four laning, six laning, what what have you. I mean, you've got uh, flyovers running into, you know, several hundreds of kilometers and so on and so forth. Well, uh, um, uh, it's a slight deviation from what I'm discussing, while we need linear infrastructure, and that's definitely one of the uh, attributes of material development or human development index also has got to do with this kind of convenience and comfort 
uh, you, you know, uh, how do you put it, uh, manufactured assets uh, that you see in your engineering and technology output. We also need to understand that this comes at a cost of wilderness, that you are fragmenting habitats, that you are altering habitats, in all probability, you are destroying habitat. So all in all, the net loss is what you need to account for in terms of loss of wilderness. And remember, there's a saying, and that's again a thumb rule, when we speak in conservation biology, say that the highest form of conservation is to conserve the habitat. I mean, if you conserve the habitat, then you conserve everything that lies there within. Uh, you need not go in for species, a specific approach of conservation, you conserve it in total. Uh, when you conserve the habitat, you conserve the, the soil, the land, the water resources, the fire, the prey base. Um, and as I put it earlier, the, the combination of climate, substrate and vegetation is, is what constitutes the habitat. So if you protect that, I think you allow the animal to definitely survive without any obstacles for longer than what it would have been otherwise. So coming back to GIS in wildlife biology, it's an important tool which helps you to understand the special context of wilderness areas. Um, uh, this is a small uh, specific example of uh, the work of uh, the scientists from Wildlife Institute of India uh, who've done an amazing study on uh, understanding, you know, the movement of large carnivores. I, I believe today, large carnivore movement ecology, carnivore uh, movement ecology in itself is a domain, a very specialized domain that is a lot of application because, you know, you need to uh, ideally have your carnivores confined to their habitats without uh, allowing them to or causing them any reason to spill over into the adjacent human settlements, less that will trigger a, 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 an immediate human wildlife negative interaction or a conflict scenario. And that's certainly not a good thing to happen because if uh, humans and animals have to coexist, they have to be within their respective confines without um, installing a kind of very hostile conflict interface. So I believe a, a common challenge that most of the wildlife managers and conservation biologists experience in the practice of their uh, uh, knowledge is how to incorporate the species movements into management objectives. I mean, is it important for a manager to uh, be in clear understanding of the movement trajectories? One species moves vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other, If uh, in particular, if they are co-inhabiting, if they are sharing resources, what exactly are the drivers of these movements? Why do animals move, basically? I, th I think that's a uh, that, that's the question. Why do animals feel the need to move? And you'll agree with me uh, that in the scheme of the evolution, movement has always been uh, a, an advantage in the sense that it allows the animal to explore the environment uh, for novel resources rather than remain in one place and probably keep on exhausting uh, the resources from that given place. And, and you know that many resources are not finite, uh, I mean, not infinite, I'm sorry. Uh, they are neither are they renewable, they are non-renewable, or they could be potentially renewable. So I think the animals move, allowing the resources to recuperate the renewal dynamics of many resources, including the fodder species in a forest for the herbivores, or the prey base in a forest for the carnivores, is definitely got to do with uh, the way the carnivores and the herbivores move, and it's essential that they move. So I believe this is exactly what some of us may need to study. And uh, you do also animals moving in response to hostile climate. Climate change is a big topic now. I mean, everybody, for a long time, people were on a denial mode. Now we've started experiencing climate change by way of a number of manifestations that you have very bizarre kind of climatic manifestations in regions where you don't expect them. For example, in Middle East, nobody expected snowfall. But nobody expected a uh, rainfall to the extent that it would cause flooding. But in many places like Bahrain and uh, some parts of the Middle East, you actually have floods happening. You have you have uh, rain beyond the season. You've got delayed rains. You've got prolonged summers. You've got events of extreme precipitation. So I think all this has got to do with climate change. What is causing climate change is you know a debate in itself and and a science in itself. But the point is. The movements in response to climate change uh, will 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 uh, certainly be a matter of worry for uh, 
those who study phenology. A, a, animals have, have started breeding slightly out of season. Uh, normally, it, it is very intrinsically uh, programmed in most of the animal genes that they shall breed and recruit to the population only when there is peak food availability. I mean, that's the rule of nature and that's so beautifully uh, integrated in the uh, the blueprint of life that most of the species uh, shall have definite breeding periodicity, which is to say that they shall not breed out of season. I mean, you understand that uh, when, if new ones start emerging in a population, when there's scarcity of resources, that's going to be a bad investment on part of the species. The entire metabolic effort and energy budget that has gone into reproduction is not going to be, you know, it doesn't stand vindicated. Uh, I, I am just trying to explain to you that animals time their reproduction with the resources of the environment in which they're going to give birth to new individuals or they're going to lay eggs and recruitment to the species. Because of climate change and all kinds of uncertainties and uh, you know, missed seasons and manifestations uh, which are not synchronous with the chronology of time, uh, it's a big challenge. Yeah, so I believe this is very important again. Uh, once again, uh, movement of animals is a very important uh, component of any wildlife study today. And how do you study movements? Probably we'll see a little later. Uh, it's important to know that the ability of animals to adapt their movements to environmental change is a critical aspect of their survival value. I mean, strategies. If the animals are not able to sense climate change and accordingly you know, adjust their movements, they could be heading for dead end. I think the conservation future uh, would much be linked with the ability to sense this kind of erratic erratic climate and accordingly adjust their movements. And that's basically what I mean. Uh, uh, we're just going to move to the next one. Uh, since I'm speaking to you from a Western Guard state, which is a very tiny little state on the west coast of Indian Peninsula, we call ourselves Goa. Uh, in local language, we call ourselves Goi. And uh, we are blessed uh, by three ecoregions. We've got the Western Guards. We have the Latritic Plateaus in between. And then we have the Coastal Plains. So we have fertile soil, which uh, sustains agricultural crops, in particular the rice, or rice are a sativa. Uh, the coastal climate also uh, assures in a good bumper, you know, a catch of fish from the Arabian Sea. And uh, in our forests, of course, are teeming with uh, exemplary biodiversity. As most of you know, Western Ghat is a biodiversity hotspot. It is an ecologically sensitive area. And I've got a few images here, which uh, I and some of my friends have captured over the last few years. You've got the king cobra, uh, which is fairly common in the uh, Western Ghat stretch. Uh, and I have to be telling you that the protected area network of my state is contiguous with the Western Guards, which, which is an added advantage. And uh, the protected area network of Goa also offers corridor continuity for movement of tigers. And I want to emphasize this, that move from uh, Kali Tiger Reserve in the neighboring state of Karnataka up to the adjacent Aminapa, Tilari region and beyond. So I, I think preserving and protecting uh, and ensuring that the integrity of a protected area and that of Western Guards, you know, generally is quintessential and prerequisite for uh, protecting and conserving a lot of these species of flora and fauna that uh, my state has been. So we've got a number of important bird areas. We've got a, a very recently, of course, only one wetland has been um, designated as a Ramsar site, but we have quite a few bird areas. We've got coastal stretches where uh, there are a lot of intertidal organisms that um, very tactfully exploit and explore both the sea as also the land. Uh, we've got mountain country in the Western Ghats. In the Latritic Plateau, we've got, that's an amazing ecosystem in itself. The Latritic, uh, the biodiversity of our Latritic Plateau is, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, I would say, lacuna in our understanding of these and more work needs to be done. But this is more or less... And uh, it's not very surprising, therefore, that uh, quite a, a quite often uh, new species new to science are being reported by 
researchers from Goa. And, and that's that's very amazing. Uh, right in the center, you have the amazing Malabar gliding frog. So that is to um, showcase uh, the extent of endemicity that we enjoy in Goa. By endemicity, I mean um, uh, the population is very restricted to certain areas with uh, restricted geographic distribution. And, and uh, taking the whole discussion further, uh, one may also would uh, like to speak about uh, uh, optics and optical instruments in study of wildlife. For example, I've been myself studying for last uh, two decades plus uh, this very interesting archaic arachnid known as a whip spider. They are also called as uh, amplipyges. Uh, and the most interesting feature of, uh, of these, uh, I would say, a very reclusive uh, arachnid species that you find normally in the caves or dark uh, places with constant relative humidity and temperature uh, or under the leaf litter in, on a floor, uh, is that the first pair of legs in these uh, seemingly bizarre arachnids is modified into feelers. Or something like an antenna, and that itself, if you are able to appreciate that from your screen, some somewhat like uh, a whip, uh, you, uh, you know, or chabuk. Uh, I hope you understand now. Koda, jise kehte hain Hindi mein, to yise uh, chabuk makdi bhi kehte hain. So this is basically called as a whip spider, which is uh, very little is known about this. It hasn't been assessed for its conservation. Uh, uh, status. We do not know that the IUCN uh, nor the IWPA schedules cover this. Central uh, globules, a kind of a secretion that one notices using only scanning electron microscopy, which can dimensional. So the image that is next to the whip spider on, I put that as A, B, C, D up to maybe O are the various spherules or globules which impart a hydrophobic character to um, the chitin. I mean, you, you're, you know, you've got the exoskeleton which is and on top of that, you have the layer of this hydrophobic substance. So again, uh, if you use scanning electron microscopy, it can entail a lot of details which are not otherwise easily appreciated using a normal uh, student compound microscope. Similarly, everybody is familiar with uh, the Pollination service offered by the bees and many of these insects. As you see on the lower left of your screen, uh, probably a bumblebee, which is, uh, uh, you know, studded with pollens all over its body. And you'll be amused to know that, uh, I mean, some many of you have probably had a course in biology. The pollen grains are beautifully sculpted. I mean, it's an amazing sculpture that you get to notice. in the pollen grains of different species. And palynologists will normally use this Microsculptural uh, peculiarities of pollen grains to uh, as taxonomic tools in identifying the flowers from this uh, which these have been put. Of course, you have wildlife forensics, which is an indispensable tool today, which is to ascertain the cause of death or mortality in animals. I believe uh, when we speak about population dynamics, one important attribute of any wildlife study is not just studying movements and population dynamics and recruitment by way of natality to the population, but also a wildlife biologist shall be able, should be able to determine with exactness to the extent possible the cause of mortality. And I think there are a number of reasons as to why the animals die. Many of them could die of natural causes because they have lived their lifespan. They could be dying because of pests, they could be dying because of pathogens, parasites, predators, or simply accidents. So I think uh, when you come across a carcass of an animal in a forest, which is retrieved by your field staff and they bring it to the lab, uh, you need to be well equipped to conduct uh, a, a, an autopsy, a necroscopy uh, on the cadaver and decide accurately what possibly could have been the reason that the animal was dead or that the animal died. In many cases, there is a judicial or a law enforcement angle. Uh, cases of poaching, wildlife crime, where you, where you want to actually frame a charge and prosecute a criminal, uh, you need irrefutable evidence out of law to, uh, you, you know, uh, nail the culprit. And sometimes if your evidences are not strong enough to stand the test of scrutiny in a court of law, 
uh, then will escape with uh, absolutely no punishment or with little punishment vis-a-vis -vis the the magnitude of the crime. So if you really want to strengthen your case and prosecute a wildlife criminal, giving very clear irrefutable evidences, you need to have a good wildlife forensic setup, which is today an indispensable tool. So I think um, wildlife forensics is an emerging field. It's fast, it's accurate, it's reliable. It gives you very good ev evidences in criminal investigations and it's comprehensive. So wildlife forensic also helps in resolving taxonomic disputes. Sometimes what appears to be one species could be something else because there could be polymorphs. There could be poly cases of polyphanism where one species looks different in different seasons. Actually, it is the same species. I'll just give you a simple example. For example, there's, a, there's this common butterfly called as the, you know, common evening brown, uh, of which you have a wet season form and a dry season form, which means it's one and the same species, which will look different both in the rainy season and in the summer season. So, you know, in resolving this kind of taxonomic disparities or discrepancies, if you want to call it that, I think forensic is a good approach. You also have... Uh, uh, a, a good, uh, uh, you, you know, access to understanding spatio-temporal genetic divergences, which means in simple words, over a period of time, because of geographic barriers or time, how uh, speciation has happened or within a species, how individuals show, you know, genetic variation. Evolutionary history is, again, something that you can uh, trace back by using wildlife forensics of species, endemism, and a lot more concepts can be more clearer by using techniques of wildlife forensics. And, and therefore, the next question, obviously, is what exactly are the samples for wildlife forensics? I've got that on the screen. You've got a scatter of fecal matter, which if you investigate properly, can give you very good, reliable evidence on what are the preferred prey species or the fodder species, because there are a lot of constituents which cannot be digested either by the gut of a predator or maybe that of a herbivore. And this will pass out through the fecal matter as it is. And as a forensic expert, if you are able to retrieve that by treating that fecal matter sample or scat sample in case of carnivores properly, for instance, in the center of your screen, I put an image from A to G and that's exactly what has been retrieved. These are remains of bones retrieved from scat of certain carnivores. So if you reconstruct that, and if you're familiar with osteology, which is the scientific study of bones, you can with a lot of certainty and confidence say that this particular predator whose scat I've analyzed is, is uh, you know, more preferably uh, leaning towards this particular place species as its food. So this kind of, uh, you, you know, certainty can uh, definitely help your understanding about wildlife management and then you start looking for uh, uh, what should I say whether the prey base is adequate for the predator number and population would you like to you know go in for artificial breeding certain decisions need to be taken on the premise of a sound understanding I, I just quickly since I'm talking about prey and uh, things like that in many parts of the world they have this artificial feeding for herbivores as well as carnivores and today we know that this is not to be encouraged unless you have reasonable funding where you can continue feeding that animal artificially for a long period of time. Because the minute they get dependent on you, uh, they, they lose you know, wild instincts uh, scouting for prey. So I think this kind of uh, tricky premises, in, uh, I mean, artificial feeding is a very slippery premise in uh, wildlife uh, management. And I think wildlife forensics for the purpose of determining the preferred prey is definitely something which uh, you know helps you in taking a call on this. So even illegal trade, sometimes people get hoodwinked by uh, poachers, the so-called you know these wildlife traders who even uh, sold uh, dog skins by painting stripes and making it look because it's tawny in color. And they, they will easily sell something which is not worth even a few hundreds for lakhs or rupees as tiger skin. In any case. All kinds of contraband and, you know, wildlife artifacts are not to be sold because we have a cl clear convention on uh, inter international trade in endangered species called CITES. In any case, for illegal trade of wild animal products, not necessarily the live animal as pets and whatever, I think wildlife forensic investigation also is very important. And there are two levels at which this can happen. Either physical identification, where you do necropsy, 
microscopy or footprints, which is bug mark imprints, or maybe whatever, or you know more or less what animal, or microscopy is where you investigate the hair, the bones, maybe in case of turtles or some other animals which carry tested in reptiles, you look at the shell, scales, ivory in case of elephants and mana, I mean, you know, some of these sirenians and cirripedians, you know, the marine mammals also have that kind of an ivory sort of dust, uh, you know, you know, you know. And at the molecular level, you look for mitochondrial uh, markers or you look for nuclear base markers, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, there's uh, microsatellite assays and you also know the mitochondrial genes like 12 is RNA, 16 is ribonucleic, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, ribosomal RNA and cytochrome B. All these kind of investigations, of course, will require of you to have that sort of a setup. Uh, to have, uh, uh, you know, the right paraphernalia for conducting molecular biology and biotechnology investigations. And that comes at a cost. So this is going to be slightly, you know, a little prohibitively expensive because you need to invest in those kind of equipment and machines and the reagents and, uh, you know, the kits are also kind of exorbitantly priced. But uh, that doesn't, or maybe, as I said, look at the right of your screen. These are some images that I put of a, a microscopic impression of a hair. Today, you will be astonished to know, I mean, this is something that we have done even in Goa. Uh, there is a trichotaxonomic catalog of wild, uh, you know, mammals in the sense that if you are able to characterize the morphology and micromorphology all the more of the hair and link that and build a database whereby the features can be at attributed to some specific species, it is very easy to identify species just by looking at the hair. I mean, if you look at the cortex, if you look at the medulla of the hair, you look at the texture, the pattern or distribution of, you know, melanin inside the hair, all these things can give you some species-specific nuances in trichotaxonomy. Trichology is a science of hair. Trichotaxonomy is, uh, a, you know, a kind of a hybrid approach where you use, uh, you know, species-specific uh, modalities within a hair structure to attribute that to a particular species. That means you literally identify species based on character of hair. And uh, of course, you, everybody is very fan of mark imprints, which in fact we have, the, and also stripes. There is, there is this uh, software called M-Stripes, which I think is now mandated across the Indian forest system, where uh, this guard is now, is, has got that loaded in the, in the mobile. You just take a click and feed that to that database. Uh, something will, I mean, it will be processed. And you know more or less whether this particular cat, a tiger to be precise, has been previously recorded or not. These are, again, this is molecular phylogeny is a new approach. Uh, it's also called DNA barcoding. Uh, there are certain genes which you use as genetic marker. I will not get into, uh, you know, specifics of all this. But this is basically what we are looking at. It's a cytochrome oxidase subunit 1 or uh, CO1 gene, which is the most popular marker used for molecular systematics. So today, we are no longer looking at, uh, say, for example, in fish, the number of scales on a lateral line, the number of fins and rays in dorsal skin, uh, you know, this distance and that distance, and, and, and all this kind of gross morphological features is a thing of the past. Today in modern technology-driven wildlife, and you may ask me, are fish wildlife? Of course, yes. Uh, the, the fact that they occur in wilderness and uh, the marine scape is, is a vast wilderness. You've got so many of these coral reefs and you, you've got the deep sea fishes, you've got the demersal fishes, you, you've got the uh, fishes in the epipelagic water mass. As I said, and let me remind you, my definition of wildlife is very simple. Everything except human beings and that which you do not domesticate. So if you ask me, something which you have cultured is definitely not eligible to be called as a wild. But if you ask me about a parrotfish or a clownfish, that certainly, in my opinion, is eligible to be called as a wildlife or other wild species because it is existing in wilderness without any human intervention. I mean, it does not need to be fed. You don't need to oxygenate the water of the sea or nobody can oxygenate or add oxygen and I, I would say a uh, feed to the fish in the ocean is something that you and I can't. So anyway, molecular phylogeny and uh, using DNA barcoding to uh, individualize species and using that as a genetic marker is again another interesting approach. You just need to know this. Uh, well, this is a new concept.
concept again called eDNA or environmental DNA and conservation management. See, I mean, we all know that when we use the environment for a number of purposes, we stay, we move through that, we forage, we uh, explore, we attempt to find mates to reproduce and so on. As we move, because of abrasion or even otherwise, maybe we deposit through our body secretion and excretion, a certain amount of DNA from our body is left in the environment. And that is what constitutes the environmental DNA. And the challenge is to harvest that and amplify it. So by either by sampling soil, because uh, species defecate out in the open, or in the water, or on, or in snow, or sometimes even in air, you have a lot of uh, the DNA floating for whatever reasons. I mean, the from, source from the animals which use that space, aerial space. If you are able to access this environmental DNA, which carries the DNA codes for maybe you don't know hundreds of animals, and if you're able to sequence it, a single sample containing DNA can be used to detect the presence of critically endangered species in the environment. I believe that's very important. So, and, and uh, you can also use environmental DNA to study the impact of climate change on species diversity. As I was speaking some time back, uh, probably the diversity was much greater earlier. Now, we change. many species are resilient. They could adapt to the climate change. There are quite a few numbers that, that just succumbs and, you know, just fall in line. They're unable to adapt very fast because you know adaptation again can happen if you the animal gets enough time to be acclimatized and you don't expect the animal to acclimate and respond to that changing environmental parameter overnight you need to allow it to you know sort of gear up its resume um, the machinery for resilience is something which cannot be activated in a short span of time so this is again very important or if you are able to identify uh, certain, uh, you, you, you know, biochemicals associated with novel pathogens. Let me just tell you, for instance, sometimes through trade and commerce portals, we unfortunately and inadvertently get a lot of uh, you know, and forest is coming into our Indian territory. For instance, a, a decade and a half ago, the, uh, the, the sea from Chennai port reported new uh, strain of cholera which was absolutely amazing because uh, until then, uh, the cholera strain that we were reporting from our uh, last water operations and this kind of sewage discharge what, and whatever else, you could sometimes using eDNA, uh, you could also be able to identify and preempt this sort of threats from novel pathogens. Overall health of the terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem, I mean, the richer the eDNA content, of your uh, sample, whether it is water or air, the more diversity. All right, quickly. Uh, this is in continuation with how um, many interesting, uh, you know, sensory equipment or many, many, I mean, what you have on the left is sensory equipment uh, present on the whips of whip spiders, which I spoke to you some time back. Uh, we are very shortly getting up the first paper ever on the sensory equipment on the feelers or the antennae of Indian whip spiders is just set to be published maybe in, in a short time from now. I mean, that's a work from my research group. Uh, we just, um, I mean, that's under process. I mean, it's under print. I mean, it's going to be released very shortly. But uh, the point that I need to highlight and emphasize here is it wouldn't be possible for anyone to appreciate the kind of extraordinary sensory assemblage that one can notice on the sensory legs or the whips of a whip spider without the aid of scanning electron microscope. And what you see on your screen are absolutely scanning electron micrographs. The one on the left is not my work. I have just borrowed this from a foreign author, a good collaborator and a friend from Brazil. And on the right is my work here, which we have done using facilities at National Center for, uh, you know, Polar and Ocean Research in Goa. We have two institutes of high repute. One is National Institute of Oceanography, a CSIR Institute. And the other is an affiliate of Ministry of Earth Sciences, and that's called NCPOR, National Center for Polar and Ocean Research. This is where we access this uh, state-of-the-art instrumentation what you need and uh, here i have uh, on the right on the left is the whip spider 
on the right, whatever you see is my own research on whip scorpions. Uh, these are called Europygies. And they are, it's a misnomer because they are really not scorpions per se, that they don't sting, but they're also called vinegaroos uh, because they, you know, spray a kind of a very caustic and vinegar-like vinegar -like, uh, secretion uh, in defense of any sort of a disturbance. Now, ye sara mungkin nahi ho pata agar hamare paas scanning electron microscopy jaisi facility nahi hoti. This, the point is very simple. You could still be doing a lot of work, but you would not be able to fine-tune it to this kind of precision and details, but for the scanning electron microscope. So again, this is bioacoustics in emerging field in which you record animal sounds, you have a spectrogram, you try to you know decipher what exactly is the amplitude, frequency of the various, and trust me, you can be so specific that uh, every single, uh, currently I have got an ongoing uh, research program on diversity, distribution and conservation threats of, to bats in Goa. Obviously, we are a Western Ghat state. This is one species that has not been thoroughly investigated for obvious reasons that it is not easy to work on bats because they are nocturnal. Uh, they are uh, pretty, sec you, you know, reclusive because they, you don't find them very easily unless they are roosting in a place or unless they are foraging. And uh, their creatures are dark and there are a lot of myths associated with bats. So generally people would not want to, you know, venture into this kind of uh, chiropterology, which is the science of bats. But I need to tell you, and as you can see on your screen, each bat, it emits sounds which you can hear, they are audible, and also sounds which are ultrasonic. I mean, you can't hear, it's not within your hearing range. Uh, in, uh, our group has recently procured this uh, bat locator which can record that ultrasonic sounds emitted by bats and we do a lot of spectral analysis and we come up with an bioacoustic signature which is very specific to bat species. So the, the use of this technique is very simple, it is non-invasive, all that you need to do is record the call do the spectral analysis and even without having seen the bat you know that that particular species exists totally non-invasive. It's like, it's miraculous. That all that you need to do is just record these sounds or record the vocalization. Okay? And then the spectral analysis in the comfort of your lab and your own setup. And then there is a database with which you compare your spectral analysis and character of whatever the details, frequency, amplitude, the whole spectral analysis. You can compare it with it. जो डेटाबेस ऑलरेडी हमारे पास है हालांकि इंडियन स्पीशीज की ज्यादा डेटाबेस है नहीं व्हाट इज ऑलरेडी अवेलेबल आर द यू नो स्पीशीज ऑफ बैट्स बियॉन्ड इंडियन ज्यूरिस्डिक्शन बट वी आर स्लोली कंपाइलिंग एंड एड्रेसिंग द गैप्स इन इंफॉर्मेशन द सेम स्टोरी विद आई वुड से एन्यूरेंस ऑफ फ्रॉग्स आई हैव डन अ स्मॉल स्टडी इन माय स्टेट व्हिच आई थिंक नो आई एम सॉरी आई मे बी लेटर स्लाइड्स where we have done we have recorded the croaks of something like 10 to 12 species of frogs and we realized that uh, each uh, species of frog has a very unique bioacoustic signature of its croak. So, I mean, we, we lament that nowadays you don't get to hear this, kya uh, kehte um, frogs croaking in your backyard, good old days, purane zamane mein, jab bhi barish hoti thi, you would hear a orchestra of all the frogs, you know, singing in unison, may not be music to yours, but... As a child, that would be very fascinating. Today, the onset of summers are very silent. That reminds me of the famous book by the American author Rachel Carson, The Silent Spring. So, na keval hamari spring silent ho hamare monsoons bhi abhi silent hone lage. And that is alarming because, you know, these species which used to herald the arrival of seasons or change of season are not there today because of climate change and many other uh, you know, drivers of this kind of uh, pressures like you've got pollution, you've got climate change and, and whatnot. So, you know, this is again an, a new approach. To this. this is amazing again, biologgers. Uh, just imagine if you're able to implant or strap a miniaturized, uh, you know, kind of a biologger or an instrument or small, a small electronic sensor which continuously records the physiological parameters of the animal and also has a GPS integrated there or maybe even a camera 
which can continuously send signals and data through a satellite linkage. I mean, you'll get a real-time database which you can sit in your own lab and comfort of your own lab and you know continuously procure that data even without having to go to the field. So what you see on the left side is a wandering albatross which is a migratory species. On the back, you've got a logger attached. It's called a biologger because it, you are able to tag and track that animal as they are naturally moving in the environment. What exactly is the kind of information that these biologgers will send to you and record in the first place? Because these miniaturized biologgers have got sensors which can pick up a lot of signals, not only from the external environment of the animal onto which it is attached, but also from inside the body. GPS location, so you know exactly the animal which you have bio, I mean, tagged with a biologger is at this particular GPS location at this point of time. What is the surrounding features? What is the paryavarani? What is the kaisa hai? What is the condition of animal's body? What I mean, that's again, what is the heart rate, right? It's very important. What is the speed at which the animal is moving, the trajectory? ये सारा इनफॉरमेशन आपको एक जगह पे बैठ के मिल जाएगा। बशर्ते आपको बायोलॉगर ठीक से अटैच करना है। It should not be heavier than the, I mean, it should not interfere with the normal and natural movement of that species, and it shall not interfere with with any critical functions of that species. Travelling speed का ये, depth of the water, अगर ये पानी की कोई प्रजाति है, so, you know, the matter of fact is how deep the animal has gone inside the water also you can come to know. And then uh, you will ask me, hai, it keeps on relaying, but would you not want to recover that biologer? Yes, absolutely. That is also possible. That once you trap that animal, you can recover the tag and you can simply connect it like, you know, like in any external hard disk or whatever to your computer and read all the data and download. So, you see, today we have, we are at crossroads. You know, we have come a long way. From use of uh, the human senses to uh, decipher all that you see and hear and feel to use of advanced technology for precision data. This is very important. But as I was just saying, biologging at the crossroad of discipline. See, you got satellite telemetry system, which is very simply, if you are able to you know connect this biologger with a satellite which, which is already moving in your orbit. Then you, you've got a, you know, it's like having your uh, Tata Sky serials on your computer. Ki bhai, what speed is the bird flying at? What is its heart rate? Where is it at this point of time? Absolutely everything because it's, it will have miniaturized GPS also inside. It, is, it has got sensors. It has got accelerometer, which means the speed at which it is moving also will be recorded. I hope that's clear to you. The depth at which the animal is swimming. So this biologging is something brilliant. You can have great understanding of feeding ecology, breeding ecology, resting area of our species. You know, I mean, this is again artificial intelligence in a sense. So all these miniaturized devices are able to do something which possibly no human faculty would be able to do altogether. That is me uh, when I was being trained in uh, Montpellier University in France uh, by European uh, Congress of Conservation Biology, they host a lot of these workshops. So I had opted for something like this, which is remote monitoring with radio telemetry. As you all know, wildlife radio telemetry is a kind of a collar or a tool which has got a miniature, miniaturized transmitter that will keep on emitting signals. Uh, and as the animal moves, you get the location data, which you can, of course, correlate with many parameters to obtain information on is there a particular kind of environment or habitat that the uh, animal prefers? What is the extent of movement, uh, rather, uh, you know, distance that it covers in course of its movement? Uh, what is the population dynamics? What is its behavior? You know, you know, this is again very interesting. And how do you choose the transmitter? Uh, which you, feel? I mean, the collar that I'm holding in my hands are basically collars used for large animals like carnivores. Right. So, I mean, it, it is to be, it's like a neck collar with, with an antenna and a miniaturized uh, transmitter that keeps on emitting electromagnetic waves, which need to be picked up by another, uh, you know, sensing antennae. 
which you have to probably move on elephant back or in your vehicle slightly at a high elevation so that you pick signals and uh, you, you know it translates into very clear uh, information on the way the animal is moving what so i mean uh, the only precaution that one needs to take in this case is that it should not weigh more than 5% of the animal's body weight these are some of the candidates for telemetry in india as you know all this i'm not going to i mean you've got the wild dog you've got the leopard you've got the melanic panther or the leopard you've got the jungle cat snow leopard and of course the golden jack all i mean i mean the wild cat as well this is what i was just explaining to you i'm not going to speak much radio telemetry um i think i've already explained that to you you can pick a signal from as far as 5 km sometimes of course there are issues jaise ki aapne suna hoga ki abhi filhal jo discussion chal raha hai on the cheetahs uh, some individuals have found dead uh, due to sepsis or septicemia caused by the wound inflicted some are very unfortunately when the collars were being fixed i guess uh, you know it kind of because of abrasion or whatever they had a wound which probably did not heal uh, and maybe any other reason for some reason they were immunosuppressant and they are also in a very new place so it as i said earlier it's a little uh, not very easy or little difficult for animals to adapt to a new habitat so unfortunately there was mortality in some of those radio collared cheetahs that we got from namibia now anyway we learned through our mistakes but important thing that you need to understand is that gps enabled collar helps you to track the movement of these animals not only for regular purpose but also if you want to know what is the trajectory of a rogue animal which means an a habitual offender and how do you fit this collar very obviously you need to first tranquilize the animal using immobilization drugs there are there is a big list you got nicotine sulfate and these are basically muscle relaxants which uh, you know kind of will it doesn't uh, क्या कहते हैं ये ये जानवर को बेहोश रियली नहीं करता लेकिन इसके मसल्स इतने रिलैक्स हो जाते कि मूव नहीं कर पाता अदरवाइज इट्स वेरी अलर्ट बट यू जिन नॉर्मली टू मिनिमाइज द स्ट्रेस कॉज टू द एनिमल यू नीड टू कवर द आइस एंड देन ऑफ कोर्स वंस यू फिट द कॉलर विद इन द मोस्ट ऑप्टिमल टाइम लिमिट यू यू कैन स्क्रू अप द कॉलर देयर टू द नेक इन द राइट प्लेस एंड आफ्टर दैट यू नीड टू एडमिनिस्टर एंटीडोट so the animal is back it springs back you know to its uh, what is a normal uh, behavior but sometimes uh, you need that that's where a lot a lot of people make mistakes and there have been some serious consequences that uh, in the in the midst of the collaring operations uh, the effect of the tranquilizing drug has uh, end off uh, putting the you know the scientists at a huge risk but still they were fortunate enough to have escaped so i think this is very very important sometimes the battery on which the collar works will be you know you know lost sometimes because of animal movement the collar is shed or lost so you know this is a sad part that after you know a long period of time all the data that has been recorded in the collar if the i mean the transmitter the collar is gone it's gone i mean this is what i was speaking wherever you have tiger country you also have a few conflict issues i'm not going to speak on that but let me quickly take you through anti poaching technology you know wildlife crime is a major issue in a country like ours in africa the common factor a common denominator both in uh, indian subcontinent african subcontinent is that we are teaming with wildlife so wherever you have extraordinary wildlife you've got extraordinary criminals and uh, the biggest challenge is to uh, win over all their you know um uh, or modus operandi so you know uh, there is this new technology in which you implant a certain kind of a it's it's a sort of a biologer a miniaturized uh, transmitter in the horn of the uh, rhino uh, which will uh, you know record all kinds of body parameters or physiological parameters of this uh, animal and the minute there is poaching aap samajh lijiyega Okay, if the poachers shoot this animal, uh, and they invariably, if they miss it, or if there is just a gunshot uh, which is not fatal, the animal is wounded, is bleeding, it's running fast to escape. There is certainly going to be an altered uh, cardiodynamics. The heart rate will change towards an increase. All these cardiodynamic, uh, you know, changes will be picked up by the sensors and transmitted 
to the control center via satellite where you already have people constant constantly you know monitoring the changes uh, if any with in, in you know the information that is being received and further the control center will alert the nearest anti poaching uh, unit surveillance unit uh, giving specific GPS locations and they will reach that place using the helicopter or any aerial mode of transport within the minimum time, hopefully and uh, ideally to prevent the killing of an animal or in case the animal has been armed, at least they will not allow that poaching episode to be successful. So this is the blessing I would say or the magic of the technology driven uh, wildlife. Uh, then there are a few, I mean, I'm not going to talk about unmanned aerial vehicles. This is brilliant again. Uh, you don't need to actually deploy uh, your, uh, you know, human beings in the field for surveillance. And since this flies over, it gives you a wider field of vision. You can do wonders. It can cover vast stretches of land uh, and, and particularly terrains which are very difficult to patrol on foot. So it's going to save you a lot of uh, money, a lot of uh, manual labor, and it's going to do a precision uh, reporting. Uh, you also have use of unmanned uh, aerial vehicles in population enumeration and monitoring. What you see on your screen is a tern colony. A tern is a very interesting bird. And this particular uh, group of scientists who you can see on your screen, they use fox tern colony, meaning to say they used uh, rubber ducks or decoys to create a situation like that, you know, in a pre-designed matrix. They wanted to know how these birds space out their nests. Basically, it was Gerard Hodgson who was interested in understanding the nesting ecology of these terns, turn colony. So what he did is he simulated a certain nesting colony by placing decoys or, uh, you know, rubber uh, turn toys. I mean, look at that. That's again something very interesting that you are actually using decoys or toys or replicas to understand how exactly do they space out their nest in a crowded colony. So again, then you have, uh, this is something which really excites me. It is called a snot bot. A snot bot is something which is used by, uh, you know, people who study marine mammals, particularly for collecting samples of body fluids. So what it is, what is done is, it's basically a very simple, you know, quadcopter, which means it's, it's got four uh, propellers. And it's basically like an unmanned, uh, you know, aerial vehicle, which will position itself exactly uh, above the blowhole of, uh, let us say, a whale. You know, whales have the habit of uh, throwing a jet of water uh, intermittently. And uh, the quadcopter, which is known as a snot boat, is all uh, equipped with petri dishes probably with a culture media, it flies very close to the whale blow to collect samples straight from the body. So there is no contamination. And as you would agree with me, since it's a jet of water coming from deep inside the body cavity, it will carry a lot of very valuable molecules like DNA, microbiomes, hormones. So if you want to do is prajati ke swasti ka parikshan karna ho, so isse behtarin koi dusra tarika hi nahi ho sakta because you can easily get samples of whatever you choose to do whether you want to do the hormones whether you want to do the you know radio immuno assay understand the endocrine profile you want to do microbiomes you want to know the dna so look oh, you want to assess the health of that particular whale you want to know whether it, there are any novel pathogens so instead of going physically uh, dangerously close and taking tissue samples uh, manually, what you can do is deploy this snot bot. Again, a very brilliant thing to do. This is uh, the diversity of birds that we have in Goa. I started this We have a lot of important bird areas. We have a lot of data that is being collected. Uh, Goa also is, uh, a, a, you know, I would say, a hotspot for a diversity of Lapidopter species. We have got a lot of nocturnal creatures as well, including the munjak. Uh, you you have um, uh, civet cats and and you've got the land lorries and so on and so forth. Well, what are the contemporary challenges? We have got a climate change issue uh, which impacts habitats. We have a lot of um, uh, synthesized molecules which.
and for example heat sensors can tell you met refugia ka matlab ye hai ki these are last few pockets where the animals are encountering desirable combination of climate and soil and flora and therefore they've started aggregating in those last few refugia which are known as climate refugia to ye sari baatein tabhi mumkin ho jayegi jab aapke paas very advanced instrumentation available hota hai warna ye routine instrumentation se kya kehte hain aasani se nahi ho pa Uh, that's me, uh, and I have. I'm very happy to tell you that uh, we have. I have written a few management plans for a couple of wildlife protected areas in Goa. Uh, one was uh, Kotigaon Wildlife Sanctuary, which is very close to the state of Karnataka, uh, down south. And then, of course, uh, in line with that, we have the Netravi Wildlife Sanctuary. As I've said before, and let me repeat, both are uh, important. Uh, from the viewpoint of tiger corridor connectivity and ye yahan dekhiye jaise ki maine abhi kaha tha if you see very clearly we put a relief map we put a land use map we put a map of fire vulner vulnerability and finally using all this information you come up with something called as a management map so i think all this very clearly emphasizes and underpins the, the fact that today you can't rely on those orthodox good old concepts that you now need to rely on technology and take your understanding of wildlife to the next level uh, a zoo i mean i know a lot of people are not uh, supportive of zoo because they believe it's a prison for animals but there is also a positive side that uh, quite a few species may require that sort of exit to conservation intervention which is what a zoo is ke aap aise ka aise kafi sari prajatiyan hain jinke कंपेटेबल हैबिटेट्स अभी बचे नहीं है तो इनको जू में शिफ्ट करके इंटरवेंशन देना ज्यादा सरल और सहज रहेगा राधर देन लिविंग देम टू दे ओन फेट इन विल्डरनेस तो आई हैव सीन सम ऑफ दी जू पर्टिकुलरली द वन इन यूएनओ एंड दस वन अनदर इन टोक्यो जू आई मीन देवर स्टेट ऑफ आर्ट फैसिलिटी फॉर एसिस्टेड रिप्रोडक्टिव टेक्नोलॉजी इंक्यूबेशन सेंटर्स यू नो all that you and i may not even have an access to for our own species in india in the western world you've got these ultra modern facilities which makes the practice of wildlife biology extremely fascinating and interesting in china for people get this impression that basically frozen zoo concept ye hai ki this is the largest and the most diverse collection of germplasm in the world which means uh, aisi prajatiyan jo क्या कहते हैं यू नो लुप्त होने वाली है नाम शेष होने वाली है एक्सटिंक्ट एक्सटेंशन के बहुत करीब आ चुकी हैं ऐसे स्पीशीज का जर्म प्लाज्म माने बोथ दिमेन फॉर स्पर्मेटोज हुआ एंड आर हार्वेस्टेड एंड प्रिजर्व इन लिक्विड नाइट्रोजन एट वेरी वेरी लो टेम्परेचर देन ऑफकोर्स एज एन वेन यू नीड यू सॉर्ट ऑफ तो दैम्पल एंड यूज इट फॉर रिप्रोडक्शन पर्पज सो जस्ट इमेजिन that uh, in this kind of a facility which is called as a frozen zoo you got something like 10000 living cell cultures which are preserved cryo preserved which is more appropriate a word at very very low temperatures you got oocytes you got sperms which are gametes of course then you also got frozen embryos uh, representing nearly a thousand taxa which is extraordinary i think this is the wonder of technology driven wildlife biology and i mean this is basically what i'm saying the irreplaceable living cell lines gametes embryos all this stored in one single place a centralized facility is an absolutely invaluable resource for conservation purpose assisted reproduction and it can make you understand new facets of evolutionary biology and wildlife medicine too so ye bhi bahut si interesting cheez hai so with that i finish with the first part i mean next 5 minutes very quickly i will go through fast on career options i am just going to quickly i mean many a times if we are in a teaching profession and if we are uh, teachers um, uh, aise bahut mauke aate hain jab uh, chhatra chhatra se ye sawal puchte hai ki bhai if we opt for a subject like zoology or wildlife biology what are the career prospects so i mean you can be a wildlife biologist you can be a forest or wildlife no enforcement officer you can be a wildlife veterinarian you can be a forestry consultant as a freelancer you could be a forestry scientist i'm not getting into the details of this 
but very grossly let me you know identify the career options today after covid you know everybody there are so many openings for zoonosis experts and zoo anthropologists expert and i hope you know the difference between i'm sure rather zoonosis would mean obviously the pathogens that we acquire from wild which is what uh, everybody believes sars cov2 virus was coming from the bats and zoo anthropologists is something reverse which is the the pathogens that we human beings transmit to the animals for whatever reasons so is the expertise be is a career option and then of course people need entomology they need marine conservationists they need you know several people uh, to join the ngos for their mandate on conservation i mean you have ww doing very well academy of course you need teachers to i mean you definitely need teachers to probably enthuse people and make them understand the finer aspects of wildlife biology wildlife tourism of course is an emerging area because people are tired of mass tourism mass tourism or conventional tourism has reached a point of saturation and in many places a point of no return for the kind of environmental impacts that i can tell you for goa goa is no longer uh, as somebody who resides in goa you know i no longer would want my state to be identified as a land of sun sand and sea i say look beyond the sun sand and sea there is also a green goa which is uh, you know more beautiful than the coastline in our uh, hinterland in, in along the western ghats so this green tourism or soft tourism options is a new uh, enterprise wildlife journalism how many people write about wildlife koi nahi likhta bahut kam log likhte hain so i think if you need to have a separate brigade of journalists and mass media to focus on these issues wildlife forensic experts mai zyada baat nahi karunga kyunki maine bahut detail mein iski discussion ki hai wildlife photography again that's a big take i mean if you remember that famous movie three idiots how one of the three guys you know uh, a character played by madhavan he, he feels so suffocated that he is not allowed to pursue his passion of being a wildlife photographer and at the end when he is allowed to do that he really makes a mark in that field so i mean that basically what it is and then of course in india we are blessed with uh, amazing institutes which are centers of excellence not just for our country but for whole asia for instance you have the wildlife institute of india and of course the south india center recently which is second it is a south india center for wildlife wildlife institute of india salim ali center for ornithology and natural history right second in Coimbatore. They offer MSc wildlife courses, MSc heritage and conservation management. They give a lot of consultancy to government and uh, private, uh, you know, uh, project proponents. You of course have the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, which has a lot of openings. And if you log in into the website, you get to know you can join the Indian Forest Service and serve the country and the uh, towards protecting and conserving its natural resources. You could probably join. the wildlife crime control bureau which again uh, plays a critical role in uh, detecting detection and prosecution and uh, how would i say avoidance of wildlife crime it's a very important uh, stakeholder you have the national tiger conservation authority where you have regularly a lot of openings coming up as consultants and research associate also kol mila ke main ye kehna chahta hu ke agar koi ye samjhe ki bhai wildlife bio is purely an academic pursuit aur isme koi opportunities nahi hai to that is a misconception ek galat dharna hogi and the right thing is agar aap kisi bhi cheez ke expert hote ho to opportunities apne aap khul jati hain and you also have a lot of uh, new national center for biological sciences you know the ais you know the salim ali uh, pakshi vigyan evam prakriti vigyan kendra jo कोयम्बतूर स्थित इंस्टीट्यूट है आइसर न केवल पुणे में बहुत सारी जगहों पे आई थिंक टुडे स्काई इज द लिमिट एंड आई थिंक नो बडी शुड रियली यू नो लुक डाउन ऑन वन डोमेन ऑन नॉलेज एज समथिंग विद लोअर एप्लीकेशन एंड समथिंग एल्स एज बीइंग यू नो अ रेड कारपेट फॉर एम्प्लॉयमेंट एंड थिंग्स लाइक आई आई बिलीव इन वन सिंपल आई शुड से रीजनिंग दैट इफ यू आर एक्सीलेंट एट व्हाट यू डू यू आर वांटेड and people will approach you don't need to go looking out for opportunities the people will come looking out for it i think that is that was the last statement and um, i mean that if for instance i just give you a simple this is a greater adjutant stork which i photographed in uh, the state of assam at guwahati again this is an iucn listed uh, bird which um, uh, has been revived 
through the engagement of community um, in Assam. So, uh, you, you know, I mean, uh, you, you need not always with wildlife end up doing some kind of lab invasive research. You can always uh, do a lot of work towards species, uh, you know, saving species through involvement of the communities as well. So that was my last slide. And I hope uh, I have been able to uh, open up some uh, new dimensions in understanding wildlife biology, which can be uh, made more interesting and more precise and accurate in terms of the kind of data that we generate and gather in the for the larger mandate of protecting India's wildlife health. Thank you for your uh, interest and thank you for your questions. Have a pleasant evening.